Hello, I'm Kay Drowen. Welcome to Fatima Today. When we think of the three little children of Fatima, we think of three lovely, simple shepherd children. Before they even saw the angel of Portugal, who came in 1916 to their little fields where they were watching the sheep, they were religious children. They would bring their rosary each day, and as they say, said their lunch, they would also say their prayers. And they would play as the sheep grazed. It was a simple life, and they were happy. When Our Lady came in 1917, she had a great concern for those who were not so happy. And she asked three children to give up the things that were very special in their lives, like maybe just sweet, or maybe their lunch, or maybe some extra water, and give it to others. They made up these little sacrifices themselves. She didn't give them any specific thing to do, but they wanted to help others be happy with this beautiful lady in heaven eternally. And she promised them heaven. Today, we find people seeking the happiness that those children had in their hearts. And they seek everywhere. They seek New Age. They seek many different religions, looking for the truth, the something that's going to fill up the emptiness in their lives. Today we're going to discuss what that special something is that can fulfill each and every one of us. Please welcome our co-producer, Roy Shulman, and Bobby Bloom, and they are going to discuss what they found to be the magic in life. Please welcome our guest to Fatima today. Hi, Thank Roy. Welcome Hi. back. Great to be here. And here. also you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank You've you shared very much. Your, your story with us, mm -hmm. and uh, it was fascinating. And Thank Roy you. is always a very popular guest, I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we, we were talking about that. We said we should do a show about this because we have uh, you two, both of you, uh, were examples of what I was saying at the beginning of the show, where you, you were searching mm -hmm. to fill up a void, an emptiness, an unhappiness that was just there, mm -hmm. and uh, and and find, wanting to find that something. And the both of you had a very similar journey, that, and, and you don't even know each other, but you had this similar journey of seeking mm -hmm. truth. Sometimes I think that a, a funny kind of disadvantage that that cradle Catholics might have is that they don't realize the treasure they have because they have nothing to compare it to. So if they're reasonably satisfied in life, feel a reasonable amount of peace and, and fulfillment in life, they may not be fully aware that they only feel that and they only have that because they're in a state of grace and they know Jesus. And um, there is a kind of backhanded advantage to growing up and even going through young adulthood without knowing Jesus, which is that we know the emptiness of the alternative. And I know that in my case, um, before my conversion and before um, the events which led up to it, uh, in some ways I had everything. I, I was a professor at Harvard Business School when I was 30. Um, I had plenty of money. I had a, you know, very um, successful Cambridge, Massachusetts, yuppie academic lifestyle. No, well, you were also an undergraduate at MIT, right? That's right. That didn't hurt. <laughs> that didn't hurt. <laughs> and um, I don't think I was consciously aware of it at the time, but I lived in a state of desperation. Nothing had any purpose. Um, nothing fundamentally, th there, w there was really no meaning or, or reason for anything. And um, every aspect of life was tremendously fragile because without knowing the Lord and without having a sense of, of divine providence and what life is about, even if you have everything, um, you know, t tomorrow you could wake up paralyzed or you could get hit by a car and sooner or later, in any case, you're going to, to grow old and die. Um, so there was just, there was just a, a blackness at the bottom of everything. And uh, frankly, I do not understand how anyone who doesn't um, 
have the fundamentals of faith <coughs> can be happy at all. And th that's really the reason why um, I frankly pray so much for the conversion <coughs> of Jews isn't because I want to, you know, prove that I'm right or anything. It's just because, you know, I, I want, frankly, to see them be happy and be fulfilled. And I know, I know the, um, the emptiness or the yearning that's in most of their hearts. Mm -hmm. um, having a sense, perhaps, underneath the surface of the existence of the Lord, but not n knowing him. I don't know if that... Now, both of you, I should tell our audience, converted from Judaism. That's right, although mm -hmm. I came across an interesting line earlier today where a, uh, a bishop said, it's not really right to right. refer to it as a conversion when it's a matter of a Jew. You should refer to it as a veil being torn. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. I like yeah, that. Very, very nice. Right. Well, um, who is the engrafting? <laughs> right? That's because right. Because the Christian is really uh, the root of Jesse, uh, of course, is the, the Jewish people. That's right. And my theory is that um, part of the reason for the Jewish people was to pray for the coming of the Messiah. We know that, that um, the Blessed Virgin Mary as a, as a girl was, was you know, yearning and praying so fervently for the coming of the Messiah that she was um, you know, an instrumental agent in, in, in bringing about our redemption. And I think the Jews were in some sense made to pray for the coming of the Messiah, so they were made with a particular hunger and thirst for him, and which just makes it all the, all the sadder when, when they don't know him. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bobby? Did you have that same feeling? Because you were searching, too, uh, through New Age and uh, looking for a meaning in life. Right. Um, yes, I think it's very similar, once again, where I didn't realize that I was not happy there was just something that made me yearn for, let's say, more happiness. Something was missing. There, will, there was something missing. I think that, um, you know, with the old saying um, about people who are searching for material goods or anything along those lines, they're always searching because they're not being fulfilled. They're, they're not filling. There's nothing in this life that really can fill you um, on a materialistic level. Um, as opposed to when you have Jesus, he can fill you so much that in the same sense where you're still you're searching for more, except in this direction, you're searching for more because you've been filled and you want even more of that love and tenderness um, that only our Lord and Blessed Mother can give you. Mm -hmm. What would you say to <clears throat> someone who is Jewish and mm -hmm. uh, a peer of yours if they asked you, how can you be sure? How, what, what made you be sure? Other than the fact that, you feel f that you're feeling filled with God's love, what gave you that certitude? I'm awfully glad they haven't asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, all I can say is, you know, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Um, I'm not sure that... That's a that there's any other way to say it, but seriously, taste and see. In other words, if, someone, if a Jewish friend of mine said that to me, I think my inclination would be to just try to get them to, to agree that if this is really true, if Jesus really was the Messiah, if Jesus is really there just waiting to enter our hearts and enter our lives, then would you be willing to accept him if this is all true and get that person to agree that they would be and maybe get that person to um, agree to say a prayer like Charles de Foucault, who is a, um, I think he is a servant of God. I don't think his canonization has gone beyond that, but he was a Frenchman earlier this century, who was an atheist who became a, um, started a religious order, converted, became a priest. And uh, his prayer was simply, God, if you exist, then let me know you. And so I think I would just encourage them to pray, you know, God, okay. if you exist, let me know you. Jesus, if you're for real, let me know you. And he and his blessed mother will do the rest. Mm -hmm. I also feel that it's very important to um, live as a, as a good witness so that, um, you know, th they see your life, they see your happiness, they see that, you know, to be true to your word, to be a good friend, to reach out, to be supportive, to be loving, and to be real 
with all of that and, mm -hmm. and to allow our Lord's love work through us so that they can actually meet Jesus through us mm -hmm. so that any answer that we give, you know, hopefully they will respond in their mm -hmm. hearts. I just recently, my Jewish cousin just asked me to send her a rosary. My gosh. <laughs> Is this is the cousin who was really angry with no, you because you're no, converted? No, this is a different cousin. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, she... Oh, her, her family's not going to be too happy with you. Oh, well, I said to Arlene, make sure it's hidden. I don't want anybody finding it. They'll know where it's come from. <laughs> but she, oh. I said to her, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable making you go to a priest and having it blessed. Why don't I buy you the rosaries? I'll have them blessed, and then I'll send them to you in the mail. Oh, she was thrilled. Now, why do you think she wanted it? Did she tell you? Yeah, she did. Um, I've been raving over St. Therese to her. <laughs> and, and I know when you were baptized, you took the little flower, yes, St. Therese's yes. name as a middle name. Yeah. Our Lady is Marie, is your right. first name. Marie Correct. Therese mm -hmm. is your Christian name. Right. Um, St. Therese, I believe, has been with me since day one. And... Um, even actually after I came back from my Albuquerque trip, um, I found a Catholic um, prayer book on my nephew's floor, which came from my brother-in-law, which is another whole story, but it wound up on his floor and I picked it up and every single time I would open it, it would open to St. Therese's page to the point where it became a game and I would say to my mother in bed, Mom, look! And I would open the book and it would always open to her and she'd say, would you stop it already? <laughs> but your mother wasn't too happy about your conversion, I right? I don't think so. <laughs> no. Um, now, what do you mean St. Therese was with you from day one? From day one of your beginning to accept Catholicism? I, th I it's very difficult to say because I've never met her. I mean, I've met her, but I've never spoken with her, so I don't know um, if that really implies since day one, since before day one, before I was born, or before I became converted. Uh, you know, I, I just don't know, but, but I felt think of it. You felt since when? Be just before my conversion. Just before your conversion. And, of course, uh, that's what she wanted to do. She asked the Lord to let her spend her heaven you know, bringing souls to him. Right. And uh, so she, she certainly is a great missionary. And the church has recognized her. She never left the convent. She always wanted to be a missionary. Right. Never left the convent, brought more souls to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a wonderful story. Uh, you know, um, when we see a convert from Judaism, I think we're always curious. I mean, you can't help but be curious because it isn't like a, an Episcopalian or, you know, a Methodist who has known of Christ, uh, but you not accepting the Messiah as people. It's always a curiosity to the rest of us Christians is what, what brought them to this? Because oftentimes you have to leave family and, and, uh, have the experience of them being upset with you. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you betrayed mm -hmm. them. When, when you know the, um, the love of Jesus or when you know the love of the Blessed Mother, um, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. And one can't really you know, weigh it as a, on the one hand, on the other hand. I mean, um, uh, I'm not putting myself in that category, but, but there's a reason why martyrs go through martyrdom. I mean, that, you know, that, that love is in a category quite distinct from anything else that life has to offer. Mm. Now, the both of you have had a similar experience in a time when you did not have any inclinations to become Christian, mm -hmm. at a time when you weren't even thinking about God as being the thing that will fill your life, but we're searching for other things uh, that you both had a separate experience of encountering Our Lady of Fatima. Now, <laughs> yeah. I know that you, Roy, said uh, I just saw, saw a book. Uh, someone had a coffee table book, which wasn't about Our Lady of Fatima. It was a little bit sensationalist. It was actually from a New Age slant. And it was essentially you know, a hundred great miracles or the hundred most miraculous events or something along those lines. I shudder to think what the other 99 in the book were. I don't <laughs> remember having noticed them. But I opened the book and, um, you know, 
was confronted on, with the page, which was Our Lady of Fatima, and I read it. Uh, this was now, I was in my early 30s. I had never heard of it. And um, my first reaction, first I asked my friend, you know, is this for real? And he said, oh yeah, you know, 70,000 people saw it. I said, does anyone else know about this? Because I had never heard of it. And he said, oh yeah. I said, how can I find out more? He told me, you know, there are books and books and books written on it. And then my reaction was indignation. How could I have been allowed to live? Who hid this from me? Who hid this from me all, from me all my life? If this is true, it changes everything. If this is true, it's the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and you, Bobby, what happened to you? This is really strange because we, we discussed this on another show, right. but some people may not have seen it, so we'll tell them very quickly. Sure. Um, I was in college at the time, and I came home one day, and my mother said to me, oh, I taped a movie for you. It's something that, um, it's a true story, and I think you need to know about it in life. And I said, really, what is it? And she said, it's called Our Lady of Fatima. <laughs> and um, when she proceeded to tell me what the story is truly about, I got so upset thinking, how could my mother even think this or believe it? And a lady popping in from heaven and chatting with three children. <laughs> you thought she had really lost it. Lost I really it. did. And I, I went to my father and said, Dad, Mom's telling me this. And he said, well, it's true. And from, yeah. a, and from a Jewish lady, too. <laughs> Your mom. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Strange but anyway, it, 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 it hit you, didn't it? The oh, story. Oh, yeah. Like, like Roy. Like, where have I been that I didn't know about this? To the extent that I really cried from the depths of my heart, I cried. Mm -hmm. I just, it, it just really, it changed my life. I mean, maybe not immediately. I never forgot the story. There was still a little bit of an obstacle because I thought to myself, which was such irrational thinking, but... She's Catholic, I'm Jewish, <laughs> you know, she doesn't know me, <laughs> you know, she was probably sitting in my living room watching the movie with me, <laughs> but, you know, that's what I was assuming, I, I, I didn't know anything about her, I had mm -hmm. no idea, but it was that tremendous love that stayed with me mm -hmm. that helped to later on. Um, bring you back to an interest, and you too, probably, that's an right. interest in what's going on here. Well, um, it's like, like Bobby described. Um, I may not have been conscious of it all the time, but it, it, it was an itch would, which wouldn't go away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just there, and it just kept mm -hmm. gnawing at me. I, I know Roy very well because, of course, he is assistant producer here at Fatima today. And I do know that when he was um, praying, because he, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was calling out to whoever is out there, Almost a prayer like the one that you just mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, let me know if you are, are, are really uh, God. Um, and, and, you, and I remember you said, when I was really desperate and I really needed to know the truth, I cried out, let me know that you were there, God, but don't be, don't be Jesus, don't be the Christian faith. <laughs> um. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Anything but. <laughs> yeah, he too wanted a sign and a wonder, but not that one. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it, is, it is true that, that when I first um, had a very strong sense of God, I was desperately praying at the same time that it not be, that it not be Christ. And I think that's actually um, sort of almost like evidence of what I was saying earlier, which is my sense of the Jewish people is that is that Jesus is so um, eagerly knocking at the door of their hearts that they have all the furniture in the house moved up, pushed up against the door, you know, doing anything to keep from letting whoever is at the other side of the door in because I think deep down inside they might have a sneaking suspicion that it is Jesus. And so that a lot of um, what I remember from growing up was like a determined resistance to Christianity and I think the source of that determined resistance is, in fact, um, because deep, deep, deep inside, one, one senses that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, mentioned your dad mm -hmm. when we were talking on, just before we came on the show. Mm -hmm. And I said, who was who responsible for your conversion? You said, well, I guess my mom, because she showed me that film. <laughs> and she probably would never admit that today. Never. But you said, also my dad. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how did he play a role? Well, 
first of all, you know, I grew up really adoring both parents, so whatever it was that they wanted to teach me, I was always um, docile. Well, I shouldn't say I was always docile, that's a little too angelic, <laughs> but um, I've always respected w their viewpoints. And my father um, had made statements, He's pla he had planted seeds along the way, um, one of which was, um, he made a comment one day and he said, no other human being ever has or ever will create such a bang in history as Jesus. Well, that's true. How could I dispute that? I really thought about that long and hard. You yeah. know, well, and he gave you examples. You know, like the calendar starts the A.D. Exactly. In the year of the Lord. And I realized, well, it's not Buddha's life. It's Jesus' life, mm -hmm. you know. And then he would, he, he made comments about um, while Jesus was dying on the cross, and they were crucifying him and he said, it was my father who taught me the line, Father, forgive me for they know not what they do. And I frequently, when I hear that line, I think of my dad. Um, and he said the mercy and the love that Jesus had. You know, so he brought Jesus into more of a, a um, person, you know, more personable to mm -hmm. me um, and for me. And there were other little comments There was a quote that stuck with me that you told me, and that was something about Jesus as Jew. Yes, my father said um, to me, knowing as a Jewish girl growing up in the world um, on a whole, he, he wanted me to be prepared for um, the, those encounters that I might have with um, anti-Semitic people. And he said, never, ever forget that Jesus was the epitome of a Jew. I never forgot that either. Mm -hmm. So he gave you a great respect for Jesus, mm -hmm. and, and, and you were carrying that around too. And, uh, it, it, and certainly, like you say, he, he was a sincere man, and obviously a man who himself was thinking it through. Right. Did he ever speak to you about your conversion when you became a Christian? Was he upset? Did he? He was. He was very upset. I mean, um, let me correct you. I, yes, there was a, a respect for Jesus, but on a whole, I still thought of him as a nice prophet. You know, we never got into it that much. It was on a different level, I think, um, where I didn't realize the respect I really had for Jesus because there was that block. The furniture was against the, the door, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, but yes, he was very upset. Um, I was very immature at that point in my life, and so hanging a crucifix in my bedroom was not exactly the most politically correct thing <laughs> to do, you know? I just was not bright. You know? So, he, and my father never wanted to confront me on that, so he would go to my mother and say, why does she have to have a crucifix? <laughs> so I had to take that down. Then one year in, um, we were in New York, I bought three statues, not one, three. And my mother said, no shrines. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So they had to go in the closet. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Right. Um, but in any case. Um, it's, it's interesting that you now have someone who has asked you to supply a sacramental, someone in the family, who's probably giving what you're saying a little bit of thought mm -hmm. and observing you in your obvious happiness. We're talking <laughs> about the filling up and the being happy. How about you, Roy? Have, has any of your, have any of your relatives approached you? Um, in a positive way, Roy. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a little bit subtler than that. Uh, it, it was very much like something Bobby said earlier, which was, as much as my parents might hate the idea of my conversion, they, they love the, um, the love that they feel for me now that they didn't feel before. I mean, in other words, they've, they see the difference and, and they feel how much more loving I am. And that gets through to them in a way that, uh, you know, is completely distinct from any intellectual argument. So although they uh, haven't softened intellectually, um, they have warmed tremendously as a result of the love which they feel from me, which is really mm -hmm. coming from Jesus. 
And, and isn't that also in the New Testament when the uh, Gentiles uh, would say, look how they love one another as they were observing the Christians. You know, see how they love one another. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, the Gospels are full of that uh, as well, you know, giving out the love and the sharing. And there's a certain wonderful feeling of community uh, when you're together in Christ, you know, and you're sharing that. How about the Eucharist? Did that make a huge difference, or are you just feeling like you're just joining in the community with the bread? Huge. I, I try to um, to commune daily with our Lord. Um, I mean, I, I once heard a story, this is before my conversion, where a Protestant woman had apparently said made a comment to a Catholic um, stating, if Jesus is truly in that Eucharist, I would go to Mass on my knees. You know, and, and it's true. What kind of a gift? Who a, that is a tremendous, tremendous gift to be able to go every day and receive God. Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. How about you, or did you feel I, a difference I, in your life when you um, started receiving? First of all, I also um, thank God. Don't have to go more than one or two days a year without receiving the Eucharist. When I became Catholic, when I asked the priest for the first time to baptize me, he asked me, why do you want to become a baptized Catholic? At that time, I didn't believe in the church. I didn't believe in most of the teaching. I still, God forbid, believed in reincarnation. But I figured I'd better tell him the truth. So I said, I want to receive communion every day, and you guys won't let me unless I'm baptized. <laughs> and I thought he'd throw me out of there indignant, but instead he nodded and said, aha, that's the Holy Spirit at work. Wonderful. That's oh, wonderful. what a testimony for both of you. And I'm so glad you shared it with our audience because I hope those of you out there who are cradle Catholics uh, will feel a great jolt of joy from their testimony. Will you join us next week on Fatma Today? Mm -hmm.